Do you want to stay more focused on the right goals in your life or even just figure out what the right goals are for you? Do you want clarity? Do you want better work-life balance? Well, you're in the right place. Welcome to Success Through Failure. Welcome to the Success Through Failure podcast, the show that reveals failure as your path to success. You'll listen to intriguing interviews with some of the most successful people on the planet and learn how their failures became a launchpad for success and how yours can too. Here's your host, former Division I All-American wrestler, former Division I head coach, speaker, and personal coach, Jim Harshaw. Welcome to another episode of Success Through Failure. Today, I bring you Dr. Stephen Hayes. Do you feel out of balance in your life, like your family and your work or your priorities, but you don't have enough time in the day, so you're shortchanging them both? Not to mention wanting to work out more or, or do more of the things that you love. Are you easily distracted and you want to be able to stay more focused so you can lock in on the most important things that you know you should be doing? You want to be more consistent so you can achieve those goals that always seem just out of reach. Or maybe you feel like you just lack the motivation that it takes to get there. Or maybe you're just not clear on what the right first step actually is. Like every time you're about to take action, you doubt whether or not it's the right action or the right goal. I know the feeling. I've got a wife and four kids, I have a job, a rental property, this podcast, not to mention the inevitable challenges that just come up with life like you know, illness and struggling family members or car trouble. I've got a lot going on. But when I was a Division I All-American athlete, I was completely locked in. I was focused. I was balanced. And I knew exactly what I wanted and the steps that I had to take to get it. But when I got into the real world, things got a lot more complex. There's just a lot more time demands. Like everything seems to be a priority. How are you supposed to figure out what's the right next step for you? Well, I've developed a system that helps you do just that. Find the balance, the clarity, the focus that you're looking for so you can take your life to the next level. So you can start seeing the dreams that are in your mind as realistic goals and have a plan to achieve them. I've opened a few spots on my calendar for free 30-minute strategy calls so you can take that first step toward the life that you've always dreamed about. Just one simple step, one small commitment that will give you huge results, a simple phone call that will leave you with a plan. If you want this life, if you want to truly have a breakthrough, claim one of the few spots open on my calendar and I'll share with you the formula that has had people who I work with saying things like one of my recent coaching clients, Frank, who said, my only regret is that I didn't do this 20 years ago. Or like Isaac, who said, I love this version of myself the best and I'll do anything to keep it going. I've got dozens more quotes like that. If you want to feel the same way, go to jimharshawjr.com slash apply. That's jimharshawjr.com slash apply. I've never had this happen to me before, but after I hung up the, well, I don't know if you hang up on Skype or whatever that's called, right? Whatever I got, whenever I got off the interview with Dr. Hayes with Steve, uh, as he goes by on Skype, I just sat back in my chair and I stared at Skype, at my computer, at his little profile picture on Skype, just trying to process the conversation that I just had, that you're just, you're about to listen to and everything that it means for me and for you and for all of my clients and for the world. I mean, this, this man has spent four decades studying and researching and this is everything you're about to hear is based on science and this man is as open and genuine and authentic as a person can come and he told me before the interview he said jim i'm I'm not really selling anything i'm giving my goal is to give this away right he's got a new book the book just came out this is his second, well, he's written multiple books, but this is his second, the last book before this, I should say, was a was at one point the best-selling self-help book in the United States. And this next book is, is called The Liberated Mind. And I, I was just blown away. 
And you're going to hear that he's a psychotherapist by trade. I don't want you to turn that off because what he talks about is this thing called acceptance and commitment therapy. And it is used by Olympic teams around the world. So sports performance, it's used by Fortune 500 CEOs, uh, it's used by leaders, it's used by anybody who wants to perform at a high, high level, at their highest level. So it's relevant for you, it's relevant for me, and it's relevant for anybody. And this can, this helps whether it's mental illness, which he works a, a lot on mental illness, but also sports performance, business performance, social social issues, you know, social health, physical health, emotional health. I mean, it, it is fascinating. What you're about to hear is incredible. Uh, I hope it changes your life in the small way that it just changed mine, maybe a big way. Gosh, sometimes there's these little seeds that just get planted that just send your life off into just one or two or three degrees different trajectory. And I think this is one of them for me. And as a matter of fact, his, his action item that he shares at the end of the episode, he, I did it. And as a matter of fact, I will tell you after the episode what I did, what I wrote about, and how it affected me. And I hope you actually do this thing. I hope you take the action that he recommends because I did. And it just really solidified what I heard in this conversation and made it real in my life. And it took the power away from something that I, I want to share with you. I'm going to share with you, share that with you at the end of the episode. But for now, let me read you his bio. So Dr. Stephen C. Hayes is a professor in the bio de- Department of Psychology at the University of Nevada. He's an author of 45 books and over 600 scientific articles. He's the originator and pioneering researcher in ACT, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, or Acceptance and Commitment Training, which is a popular evidence-based form of psychotherapy that uses mindfulness, acceptance, and values-based methods. His research has been cited in the New York Times, Men's Health, Wall Street Journal, Oprah Magazine, and many, many other media outlets. His popular last book, Get Out of Your Mind and Into Your Life, was featured in Time Magazine and at one time, like I said, was the best-selling self-help book in the United States. His new book is titled A Liberated Mind, How to Pivot Toward What Matters. Dr. Hayes has been president of several scientific societies, received multiple national awards, including a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies. Google Scholar actually ranks him among the world's most cited scholars, living or dead, in any area of study. This guy is an expert. As a matter of fact, he's the most cited psychologist in the world. So now, as usual, if you don't have time to listen to the entire episode, but or if you hear something you like, you don't have a chance to write it down, make sure you grab your free copy of the action plan. Just go to jimharshawjr.com slash action. Now let's dive into the episode with Steve as he goes by, and uh, make sure you stay tuned in to the end of the episode where I share with you what I took away in the action item and, uh, um, and how I actually followed through on that. Steve, welcome to the show. I'm glad to be here with you, Jim. I'm so excited to be able to speak to you and, and your audience. You know, I'm super excited as well. So I first got introduced to your work from a friend of mine, former wrestling teammate at the University of Virginia. He's a therapist. And he said, Jim, you've got to check this guy out. It's amazing. He, he told me a little bit about ACT, and then which we're going to talk about here uh, in the episode. Sure. So, so stay tuned for the listeners. If you don't know what ACT is, I'm sure you don't at this point. And then I brought it up to, I was on a field trip, one of my daughter's field trips a few weeks ago. And I said, hey, I'm, I'm interviewing this guy, Steve Hayes. Maybe you know, maybe he's a therapist. I said, maybe you've heard of him. He's like, oh, of course I have ACT. And he went on and on about it. I'm like, wow, okay. And then, uh, and then I mentioned you to my wife. And she's like, of course, I know what ACT is. So uh, <laughs> you are, I mean, obviously, you know, you're, you're known far and wide for, for your work. And I'm so, so excited to have you on here because what you do is relevant not only for mental health, but also physical health, social health, and, and just performance psychology, right? For anybody trying yeah. to bring their best selves to the world, right? To work, to their relationships and anything else that they do. So turns out that's true. Yes. I mean, you're, you're talking to a, you know, a psychotherapist, blah, blah, blah. But I never bought into that idea of, you know, you got this category and that category. I want to understand why do we get in our own way and why do people prosper? And, you know, that dual thing of how do you screw it up? And, how do you succeed? 
And it turns out that it's it's not a bad of a start to when people are stumbling around anxiety, depression, substance abuse, but only if you really dig down into what are the processes that matter. Once you do that, turns out they matter in whether or not you can stick to your exercise program. And then it turns out it matters right. in how you run your business. And it turns right. out it matters like how well you do in competitive sports. And so uh, we've been on an exciting 40-year long, you're talking to an old man journey, <laughs> a, a worldwide community trying to figure out, trying to sort of hack the code of what gets in our way and what empowers us. Well, let's let's get started because there we could talk for about two hours, but neither one of us have uh, that amount of time for this episode today. So let's let's dive in. I want to lay a foundation for for the listener for our conversation. Like we live in these amazing times, and the level of technology and healthcare yeah. and entertainment that we have are just previously just unimaginable. People are living longer than ever. We have more accurate information about you know, illnesses and everything else in our lives than we've ever had before. Yet it seems that as much as ever, or maybe more than ever, many people struggle to be happy and healthy and live meaningful lives. So why, why is this still a problem? Well, it's because we're the very things that we are using in our success is to be able to use our problem solving mind. We have not learned how to put it on a, a leash and not use it when other modes of mind are helpful. So we basically are kind of like an athlete, let's say, who he wanted to do uh, weightlifting, only worked on his right arm, had this ginormous right arm and had this withered, you know, pathetic left arm. And there's all kinds of things you need to do you can't do. And it's like that. We, we have got these ginormously overextended and wonderful. I mean, look around the room you're in. Almost nothing you see would be there without language and cognition, without problem solving, without, you know, imagining futures that have never been and comparing one to the other. Yeah, but then how about when your mind says, uh, yeah, but I only want to feel good. I, don't want, I only want to remember uh, good things. Uh, I don't want to have any kind of sadness, anxiety, worry, etc. Okay, what are you going to do about that? Well, I'll get rid of it. Well, that means you're focusing on it. And by the way, if you're trying to get rid of it, like anxiety, now when you start feeling a little anxiety, the anxiety is something to be anxious about. Holy shit, I feel more anxiety. Well, oh, it will work even harder to get rid of it. Maybe I take a pill. Maybe if I, and, and now it's even more important, more central. You're focusing on it. So we've got to figure out how to put the problem solving mind on a leash, use it when it's really helpful. All the things you mentioned, rein it in. And uh, use another mode of mind when it's not helpful. You say in the book that we treat life as a problem to be solved rather than yeah. a process to be lived. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, once you're into a kind of problem solving mode, what you're going to do is compare what's going on right now to some sort of verbally imagined future that you think is ideal. There's a piece in there that's wonderful. What are your values? Where are you going? Where do you want? But, you know, when you make that comparison, guess what? You're always on the short end of the stick. No matter how much money you've made, you could make more. No matter how many people are interested, more people could be. I mean, you just take anything. That comparative mode of mind means you're not good enough yet. There's a piece in there that could be helpful motivation, but it's this negative motivation instead of the positive motivation that really uplifts people. The process to be experienced kind of mindset is there. If you saw a sunset tonight and you looked at it and say, wow, look at that. You're not going to say the pink one yesterday was better. You know, God, that that you know that cloud is wrong. But you know, when you look at your life, you'll do that. You know, right. and so we need this kind of wow mode of mind to appreciate our kids, to you know, to hug our spouse, to you know, really care, to have peace of mind. And so we we haven't learned how to do that. And where did we learn that? Where did we used to? Well, mostly we used to learn that inside our wisdom traditions, our religious traditions, our spiritual traditions, all of which are weakening. The dogmatic side of them are still there, but not the kind of mystical side. And we're trying to put it in now. You know, almost everybody knows something about meditation. That's there because people know we need something more than just problem solving. Because once you bring that problem solving repertoire just to yourself and evaluate yourself, you're always on the short end of the stick. You never have that kind of feeling of, yes, I can start from here. With my failures, for example, with my stumbles, that's part of it. That's actually what part of what's given me wisdom 
you know, so you no longer try to subtract things out, but you try to sort of show up, orient towards what's of importance and move ahead. And that uh, problem solving doesn't know how to do that. It puts you on hold when you figure it out. You know, when I feel better about myself, when I'm confident, you know, when, when I'm more comfortable, when I'm it's always this conditional thing. Life will start when dude, look at the clock. Every tick tells you life has started. Right. It's so interesting. You know, one of the core tenets of, of what I teach in my program is that, you know, we also often live our lives and, and set goals based on what's parked in our neighbor's driveway or what yeah. we see on social media or what mass media is telling us that we should want. Exactly. And it leads to these unfulfilling lives. But when we base our goals upon what we actually value, what I value, and what you value, and those are different things. It leads to a more fulfilling, purposeful, meaningful life. Am I right? Exactly right. No, you're exactly right. And, you know, that toxic thing of, you know, comparison as a way or, you know, you know, relative to others. We, we have, that's one thing that the, when you said, why are we having this? You know, you've got a computer in your pocket. It's 120 million times more powerful than what landed people on the moon. And that computer in your pocket will expose you to pain anywhere happening in the world. You can see a freaking thing live. People will live stream, but they're going to go shoot up a school. Yeah. You know, you can't avoid it now. It'll feed you a comparison. You know, this is better than that. You know, etc. It, it sort of feeds these processes of, you know, pain and others are doing better and by the way maybe you could avoid it it'll feed a feed avoidance it'll feed indulgence so that combination is a toxic combination and in order to step into the modern world with its exposure to pain and comparison i mean do you want to see gold-plated doorknobs or gold-plated toilet seats of the rich and famous you can do it you know you can look at somebody's instagram account boy does that look great you know but you're not seeing their insides you're seeing your insides not their insides you're seeing their outsides people looking at your instagram account they're thinking boy you're, you're like your life is awesome yeah. no this is cartoons these are these are you know not real so we're gonna, we, have, we have to slow this thing down and kind of learn how to create modern minds for the modern world because the modern world challenges us in ways that are orders of magnitude more difficult than your grandparents. They did not see people dying constantly. They did not know that tragedies could happen anywhere. You know, you feel insecure. Violence is less now than it's ever been on the planet. Less now. But, you know, you can't even let your kids go out and play in the park or you might get, you know, a cop showing up and saying you're endangering your children. I mean, I used to say, bye, mom. And I would go out in the canyons of El Cajon and throw rocks at <laughs> rattlesnakes, you know, try to capture tarantulas, you know, I mean, and come home you know, like six hours later. Hi, mom. And they say that you can't do that today because no. it's so dangerous out there. But so dangerous. It's less dangerous than it's ever been. Yeah, right. Ever. But we're exposed to it constantly. So we feel almost like, shoot, you know, get the guard at the gate. You know, I mean, electrify the fence. You know, give me some place where I can be safe. And so that is a challenge. We need modern minds for this modern world or we're just going to be eaten by the devices we produce that, that challenge us psychologically. We've got to be like wiser than previous generations, not stupider. And so everything's going in a negative direction with psychology and behavior. Everything's going in a positive direction with everything else. It's yeah. like a paradox of the modern world. And ACT helps us create this modern mind for the modern world, yeah. right? So can you That's talk about right. what ACT is? It's acceptance and commitment therapy. In a non-therapy context, acceptance and commitment training. Okay. And it's, it's very, very similar. So if we're working with Olympic athletes, it's acceptance and commitment training. If we're working with business leaders, that's what it's called. Yeah. If we're working with people with depression, whatever, it's called therapy. But it's really the same thing. I guess kind of give us a little bit about the genesis, kind of the 30,000-foot view, and, and why it's been so revolutionary. 
Well, it, the genesis personally came out of my own panic disorder and, and watching me, me as a young academic, you know, for, almost 40 years ago, spinning down to a point where I couldn't give a lecture to undergraduates, you know, give, could, could hardly make sound come out of my mouth. I was terrified of them. And, you know, in a three year period, it got me down to the point where basically I was going to lose everything. And and at a kind of a dramatic night, it's on a TED talk. TEDx talk, they can Google it and see it. I think I'm having a heart attack. I realize I'm having a panic attack. And I, in that hitting bottom, kind of rea- realize there's a voice inside my head that's telling me to run, to fight, and to hide. Like I actually sort of had an out of body experience. I could hear the voice. We we all carry it with us. I mean, four year olds understand, you know, goofy with horns on one shoulder and goofy with a halo on the other shoulder. Four year olds sure. do. So we get that we have voices in our head kind of telling us. And that dictator's voice, you know, that's telling you things like you have to have the better car than the person next door or whatever driving, you know. Uh, I caught it and I said, Basically, you caught you know, that dictator voice. I caught that dictator it, voice. I want to emphasize this for the listener. You have this dictator voice inside of you. And, yeah. and so I'm sorry to interrupt, but that's just such an important point. I want to point out to the listener. So you caught this voice and then go ahead. Well, and, and I caught that it was telling me to run and fight and hide from my own experience. Well, so then I know you have an interest in failure and stuff. Well, it's choose, you know, if, if you go, for example, let's say you go into a relationship setting and, you know, you've got a sixth sense that this is this person is not good for you. Right. Why? How would you know that? Because you interacted with somebody like that in the past and it was a train wreck. But it's a sixth sense. Right. Well, the mind will kind of tell you not even to notice your own feelings because bad ones are bad and we only want good ones. Well, how do we produce only good ones? When you've had failure experiences, when you've had betrayals, you've had abuse, you've had things happen, you want to learn from that. And how are you going to feel it? You're going to feel it in your in your in your, that sense. So, you know, I had played out this runaway, runaway, hide and fight to the point where I couldn't function at all. And when I realized it was the dictator within telling me to do that, I basically said, F you, I'm not doing it anymore. I'm not going to run from me. I'm not going to run from me. So if I'm feeling bad, I'm going to take my time to feel bad. And then realize bad is an evaluation. What is the actual feeling? How to pull it at its joints, see what's really going on, orient to where I am, step forward. And I quickly learned in a few years that really values can't be done if you don't have that posture because when you really care you're right on the edge of the places that you know how to hurt if you really want good relationships it hurts when they fall apart that's a package if you really love your kids you're worried about bad things might happen to them and you want to protect them from that that's a package so you can't really care and pursue anything if you're not open to what you were, you've been talking about, oh, not open to failure. You have to be open to the pain part in order to have the joyful journey part. And that's not logical, but it's psychological. It's how we're arranged because we're historical creatures and our past pains inform how we best can move forward. And our aspirations raise issues of how painful it would be not to succeed at that. And so you you have a kind of a paradox and and. When I saw that, I started bringing it into people's lives in therapy, and boom, you know, things are opening up just like it did with me. And then I started saying, well, what else? And really early on, I mean, this is now 35 years ago, we showed you could do a better job of losing weight, and you could do a better job dealing with uh, physical injuries. And, and so I knew from 83, 84, that we were on to something that applied to Everything. It's basically everywhere that a human mind goes because we quickly did a few studies. And then I went on a 20 year journey to figure out what other processes. I stopped doing outcome studies. I was not very well known. I'm one of the best known psychologists in the world. Sorry for the saying it that way now. Yeah. But at the time, I'd give talks to five people. We went for like 15, 16 years and we kind of hacked the code. What are the processes? that drive this. So the dictator's voice is one, but there's others. And then we came back in, described what we were doing. We had three or four randomized trials and Time Magazine wrote us up in a five page story, blah, blah, blah. It exploded. And it's now the most researched new method of uh, not just psychotherapy, but, but of psychological intervention, I think, in the world. And there's a worldwide community developing it. Why? Because it works. Not, but it's not work like 
it's everything in there is right or there's nothing to add. No, there's stuff in there that's wrong. Of course, that's everything in science. Everything, everything. Einstein's wrong. Everything's wrong. So, but we got to find out where it's wrong. So we've been on a exciting journey of figuring out where it's wrong, tweaking it, adding it, it and it'll go on past my lifetime. But we've hacked the code enough that we've got the twenty percent that'll do the eighty percent, and that yeah. that's what's in a liberated mind. That new that new book that walks out that whole story and history and shows you how to apply it to almost anything you can think of. Yes, and for the listener, you know. I definitely recommend the book, A Liberated Mind. I've read uh, a good portion of the book. Didn't get the whole way through it before this interview, but I've taken so much from it already. And so I want to dive deeper into this, yeah. this, this idea that our thoughts are automatic and they're so convincing. Yeah. And how do, we, how do we catch that? Because they, they just happen, right? They just happen. Most people aren't automatic. aware of it. You know, they just, they're just automatic. I, I feel like I'm pretty aware of it because in, in – in part because I'm a coach and I have to think about my own thoughts and and I do this own this work on myself. I have my own coach. Um, I happen to be married to a licensed therapist. So sure. So I, and I'm reading and researching. But I, I think most people, certainly most people who come to me before I begin work with them, is they're not conscious no. conscious of their thoughts. They they happen automatically and they're so convincing. They say I failed. And they don't even think this. They're just subconscious. I failed, and therefore I can't do X. And you're saying we need to look at that failure, live with it, face it, embrace it, walk with that pain, because if we failed and it hurts, that means that's something that we actually care about because it hurt. And we need to live with that and stick with that and embrace that. So... How well, do and you use do that, that and allow it to empower you and inform you. And so there, there's, there's six things in there, but the thing you're poking, pointing to on, on the, uh, you know, the dictator's voice first is just to sort of show, show up and catch that you're thinking because you're being driven by your thinking all the time, but you don't control it. it. It's an automatic thing. You have contradictory voices back to the horns and halos on each shoulder. And it's even freaking doing it in your sleep. I mean, you wake up from a dream and your whole day feels a little different. I mean, you, the idea that you're controlling this thing is ridiculous. It's like a little spider in your head just weaving webs constantly, making connections. And and they're so complex, you'll never clean that up. But you can back out of it enough to watch the spider do its work and use it when it's useful and not use it when it when it isn't. If I have a thought like I haven't done my taxes yet, I've only got two more weeks. Well, cool. Thanks. Thanks for that. Or or, you know, you'll only be good enough if you, uh, well, thank you for that thought, mind. Uh, I think I got that covered. You know, you got to be able to kind of use the voice when it's helpful, when problem solving applies, and not when a kind of wow mode of mind, you know, observe and describe and appreciate mode of mind is really what's needed. You don't want problem solving when you're looking at a sunset. You don't want it when you're looking at your past failures. Well, parts of it you do, but you don't want it when you're looking at your emotions. So you sure. reign in the dictator. How do you do that? We have, a. if I could just give you a, a sense of it, a feel of it, let's just take one. Instead of saying, you know, Oh, I'm a failure. Say, I'm, I'm having a thought that I'm a failure. You know, when you put people in imaging, your brain lights up completely different when you say, I'm bad versus I'm having a thought I'm bad. But aren't you having a thought? Wow. Yes. Is it an evaluation? Yes. Well, just tag it. Just learn to name it. I'm having this feeling. I'm having this sensation. I'm having this memory. I'm ha- just do, don't do it out loud. People think you're weird, but do it inside your head. And kind of when so when you note something, note what the category is. Now, what does that do? It takes something that is psychologically right up on your face and moves it out a couple inches so that you can see it, but not just look from it when you're invisible to the fact that you're looking from it. The, what where the mind does damage is where it tricks you into kind of putting it on like colored glasses, and then everything you look at is colored by it, but you don't realize you're looking through glasses. So if you could just take off the glasses enough, that's that a great see, analogy. Colored glass, and there's the part that isn't colored. So I'm having a thought I'm a failure. Cool. Is that useful to me right now? Might be. If it isn't. Well, I got some other things. So thank you for that help, but I've got some other things to do now. You don't have to convince the spider to stop weaving that web. Some of the stuff you say to yourself 
you came by honestly. You had your parents tell you stuff. You had things happen. You had people you love. You had people, you know, lovers say, you know, I don't want you anymore. You know, that's going to be in your head forever. But it doesn't have to be what your life is about. So when you notice it, tag it. That, that was just one of about 200 methods we sure. for creating a tiny little gap between what? The conscious human being and the thoughts that you're having so that you notice your thoughts, use them when they're useful, but you don't allow them to get on your face like colored glasses and you forget that you're wearing them. Can we? And that's one of six. It's critical. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this is, I think this is along the lines of psychological flexibility, right? Is this yeah. one of the six? Okay. So, and we'll talk about that in a second. So I want to, I want to first explore this just for a second. So when we recognize this thought, okay, so we have this yeah. feeling, right? This dictator says, you know, you're a failure, right? Yeah, you can't, yeah. you can't do that. Don't even go try because you failed last time. So why would you try it again? Right. And it's scary. It's bad. Right. And then you say, whoa, I just recognized that I had this thought yeah. that I'm a failure. Can we speak the truth to ourselves? Wait a second. Yeah. You're not a failure because you actually have done these other three things or you've had these other experiences. Well, now here's the, pro here's the issue. Sometimes it's speaking the truth gives you some new information, gives you a slightly different perspective. In addition to thinking about this way, I could think about it that way. That's cool. Sometimes it gets you into the silly uh, kind of make the spider do its work only one uh, particular way thing where right. you go like, I'm not a failure, I'm a success because. And then there's this little voice saying, yeah, but that, you also have. <laughs> and they say, yeah, no, yeah, that's true, but but I have this. Yeah, but you have that. But you, meanwhile, life's happening. And you're in a freaking argument with what? With some sort of automatic mechanistic process happening in your head. So what we teach people to do is when you've extracted the usefulness, sometimes exploring it, criticizing, even talking about it, creating flexibility, that's all good. But then when you've extracted it, put it on a lease. So, for example, in addition to just like noticing, like I'm having the thought, suppose you have a, a habitual thought, like I'm a failure. It keeps coming up, comes coming up. It's a theme. Sing it to the tune of happy birthday. Say it in the four voice of your least favored politician. Yeah. You get it? Sure. You know, say it in Donald Duck's voice. <laughs> I mean, literally do it out loud. Distill it down to the word failure. Say the word failure fast about once per second for 30 seconds. Failure, 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 failure. You know, these are one of like 200 methods. Like there's a bunch of them in the liberated mind. Once you get onto it and you got, you can go out on the internet and you can see all the stuff the act people are doing. Why would you do something so weird? Because you're trying to, to put the voice in a place where you can hear it and look at it, but it, you don't kind of give the keys to the car to it. You know, you can't, don't kind of don't let it just drive you. It's part of you. It's in you. It's useful. It's helpful when you're fixing your car or doing your taxes. It's not helpful for peace of mind. It's not helpful for confidence. You know, take, take confidence as an example. I bet you most high performers know that confident people do better, right? Right. Beyond that? Yes. What does the word mean? Con means with, Latin for with. What does fidence mean? It comes from the Latin word fides. What does that mean? Faith. Fidelity. Same root as fidelity. Yeah. Okay. So with fidelity, with faith in who? Yourself. Okay. Now think about it logically. See the problem, Jim. If you've got to eliminate your bad thoughts, eliminate your bad feelings, what that you're saying is, is I'm not good enough and I'm not there yet. Instead, if you can have the self-fidelity and the self-faith to notice your thoughts and to notice your difficult feelings and now come in consciousness into this present moment and what could I do that would pro move me towards what I deeply care about by choice, not by wagging fingers because I have to, not be because the car is better in the next driveway, because, but because I choose it and build habits around that. Those are the six flexibility processes. And so... Yeah, you know, you can cognitive flexibility, yes. Cognitive wars within, no. And the having the tools, it's called cognitive diffusion, to sometimes with habitual thoughts, it's not thinking differently, it's undermining the impact of the things you think habitually. You know, where where the impact on you is more like what happened when I said I'm a failure. 
yeah. than it is what usually happens when you have a thought like I'm a failure and you buy it. It's hooked you. You are now into the world in which you're a failure. No, you're not. You're just thinking. You're just thinking. You're not in any different world because you have the thought I'm a failure. You're yeah. in the world which now you're having a thought I'm a failure. What are you going to do about that? Well, you can sing it. You can repeat it. You can have fun with it. You can say it backwards. I don't even know what failure sounds like backwards, but that's another <laughs> one of our techniques. Yeah. Um, and then come into the world now kind of fresh with your ability to focus your attention flexibly, fluidly, and voluntarily on what on what is of importance to you. And you talk a lot about that. Subtract anything to do that. You talk a lot about that, that psychological flexibility. That's psychological um, flexibility. It, it's basically show up in the present with your thoughts and feelings as they are, notice them. Now show up in the world within and without with your attention under your control. Now focus on your what brings meaning and purpose to you in the in the sense of the actual intrinsic qualities of your behavior that you want to reveal to the world or want to make manifest in the world, whether that's authenticity, creativity, being loving, compassionate for, for others, caring about justice. I mean, I don't know, family, whatever you care about, and now build habits around that. So open, aware, and actively engaged. That's six things, but it's really three things, but it's really one thing. It's, it's being able to sort of be your whole self in the moment and focus on what's important, but carrying your history with you. And your past history includes things like failures, which can be a powerful ally. It includes negative thoughts, which comes along with the territory. Yeah, don't put your life uh, on hold while you solve the problem within. And like if you fight for the feeling of confidence – that's the least confident thing anyone can do because it's the least amount of self-fidelity, the least amount of self-faith. Don't be fighting for a feeling of confidence. Do the actual behavior of confidence and you will soon enough get the feeling of confidence. And the behavior is have faith in yourself that your whole person can have a history that includes things that are painful, thoughts that are difficult, but that if you come into the present moment with your full consciousness and your ability to focus on what you care about, that you can build a life worth living and that's the 20% that does the 80%. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if you're an Olympic athlete or a Fortune 100 CEO or a person dealing with anxiety and depression. Same deal. Same hack. So how does the, you know, the, I know that there are Olympic athletes using this. I know that there are yeah. Fortune 500 CEOs using this. I mean, you this betcha. is this is performance psychology at its best. I mean, what are the relevant sort of use cases for a CEO or or an athlete? I mean, um, you know, most of the folks listening are probably more along the, the, the CEO line. They're not competitive athletes. Now, uh, there are some competitive athletes listening. But for the rest of us who are in the real world and we're trying to, to be our best self, Themselves. I mean, what? Well, you know, you look at psychological flexibility principles, these things of open to your emotions and thoughts as a conscious human being, using your attention flexibly, fluidly, and voluntarily towards your chosen values and creating habits around it. Those are the six things. You take something like leadership. Well, dig into some of what the leadership science shows with things like transformational leadership. You've got three or four or five of those processes right there. It's not like we're inventing something brand new. We're finding things actually that are in our wisdom traditions, our meditative traditions, our contemplative traditions, spiritual traditions are also in just what we've learned about things like leadership and so forth. But by having the 20% that does the 80% and also by by being a little slow when somebody says, yeah, let's try this, some of those things that are contradictory produce short-term gains and long-term pains. And I would take, you know, long, larger later over smaller sooner anytime because, you know, life is a long-term game. It's not an immediate game. And most of the things that are immediate are, you know, if you just want to feel great. You know, go down to 4th Street and you can probably find somebody who will make you feel great. <laughs> you know, but your life's not going to open up by doing that. And so – you know, we, so give an example. Let's take leadership. Taking the time to know the internal lives of the people around you, being able to show vulnerability, being able to show that, that you have emotions, be interested in other people's emotions, find out what their values are. Don't just say what the company's values are. What are your values? Get into a conversation where you can have the team come together about values and vulnerabilities. Those are the kinds of things that are in 
our leadership training that I think at its, at its best, you know, taking the perspective of others, for example, a thing I do, if I'm going to meet with somebody, anybody, especially if the meeting is challenging for me, if I have time, I'm going to do a two or three minute thought of imagining this person and I'm, they're coming to meet me and I go behind their eyes and I try to get a sense of what are their emotions, what are their wants, what are their desires, what do they bring into this moment and, and really kind of open up in a compassionate and accepting way to their thoughts and feelings. And then when that person walks in the door and I'm behind my eyes, I have a, a whole well, additional world to guide me other than the you know, the game I'm playing and the, you know, the pull to put on a mask and pretend and, you know, take command or whatever the freaking thing is that the dictator (laughs) is telling you what to do. I can come in there as a human being and connect to another human being. And guess what? When you do that, things go better. People feel connected. Nobody wants to walk around in a clown suit all the time. And yet leaders sometimes think they have to walk around in clown suits and treat other people as if they're just objects to be moved around. Like, you know, pegs in a machine. And some of this is crippling us. And so we've done, for example, randomized trials with, let's say, stockbrokers. And, you know, we walk into it, this acceptance work, attentional focus in the moment work, values work. What starts happening? Well, they do odd things like they want to have family day where they bring their kids to the stock brokerage and show what they do. Well, How is that going to make money? Well, here's one way to make money. We begin to have uh, work contexts that feels life enhancing. And then these best stockbrokers who have clients will move with them when they move. They don't want to leave that work environment, even if they're maybe not making quite as much as they could over here. This environment really feels supportive. And by the way, the family feels supported. And by the way, you know, they take the time to know. You think about this if you're in leadership. Do you know the kids' names of the person that were working with you? What are, what are the names of the kids? How old are they? Where, do, where does that person live? What schools do they go to? I bet you you don't know. You know people you've worked with every day for years. You don't know their kids' names. What the heck are you doing? These are, are you with me on this? A hundred percent. Yeah. When you open up to this flexibility space, it naturally starts softening you, extends your vision and the work shows like in that these randomized trials in banks and salesforce stock they do a lot better they sell more and they start creating values-based workplaces and they start using language with each other that is more human and open and linked to emotions and caring and kids and family and and they don't leave they you know you don't have the constant turnover you don't have that constant fighting between people that is all ego based and you know who got the corner office with the windows and all kinds of nonsense and you can come together as a team and you see it you see it in competitive athletes you know we have act coaches in i just visited china they got a number of them in the olympic team there the, the uk has a number of them on their olympic teams the olympic rowing team etc the swedish hockey hockey team individual teams i was in rio so literally saw somebody win a gold medal who i know has an individual act coach i don't have permission to say the person's name but everybody on listening to me would know that name if i said it out loud wow. so why because this is a healthy way to be, is to show up with your history, come into the present, and you can learn it. It's not rocket science. You can learn it. That's, that's the important thing is I want people to realize that this, this psychological flexibility can be learned. And, and, and you know we can only go so far in a, in a short interview here, but there's so much more in the book that you can get out of this. But what I'm taking away, the biggest takeaway that I'm getting here, Steve, is that This is not about becoming somebody new. To be that leader that we want to be or or whatever it is in the world that you want to accomplish, you don't have to be you don't have to be somebody else. You have to be the opposite. You have to be fully you. It's not about putting on the clown suit. It's about being genuinely, authentically, vulnerably, one hundred percent fully you. And whenever you can be that, then it allows everything else to flow from you. All of your gifts, all of your talents, all of your abilities, all the potential that you have is you're able to, it's all able to flow out of you once you get to that point. 
I want the transcript of that paragraph, Jim, and I'm going to steal it and put it in my next book <laughs> because that is so right on. It's every freaking word is right on. That's exactly right. And but you you can learn this thing. The cool thing about the flexibility processes is they focus them down to these little micro things. You know, like who would think to be saying their habitual negative thoughts in Donald Duck's voice? It just wouldn't occur to you. But just try it. Just try it. Sure. You know, if you get the book and it has these methods that walk through it, it tells the whole science story and personal story. You'll you'll see it. And the science, there's 3,000 studies we're sitting on 40 years ago. 3,000 studies, 320 randomized trials. This is based on science. So I love that. It's it's ginormous. Amount. And, and, you know, you have a lot of folks out there saying blah, 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 blah. And it's not based on anything other than personal experience. And usually some of it's right and some of it's wrong. This, we've been able to weed out. That's what science can do, the stuff that's wrong. And we keep weeding it out. And so, you know, you can learn this in a one step at a time way. And it puts you on a journey in your life where, you know, it you kind of is useful everywhere that you go. If I, can I give a quick example? Please. Okay. So I've worked for 30 years, about 10 years ago, on all these processes that help me with almost everything that I do, you know, creating habits, really, of being more open and being more focused on values. And then my ears start ringing. Well, you know, I'm a, you're look, talking to an old punk rocker. I'm now turning 70. <laughs> Guess what happens when you're 70 if you're an old punk rocker? Your ears ring. <laughs> yeah. It's been hammering. I'm standing right. in front of 160 decibel speakers, <laughs> you know. Warning to young people, don't do this. But if you do, your ears ring. Well, right as I say this right now, my ears are ringing. They ring 24-7. But for all of the early part of our conversation, they weren't ringing, except they were ringing. What's the difference? I wasn't attending to them. Why? Well, because I went through a three-year spiral down of, oh, my God, this noise. Oh, my God, when is it going to stop? Oh, my God. And finally, I had this thought, if I shoot myself, it'll go away. Yeah. And then I had this thing that, uh, dude, that's a suicidal thought. Uh, maybe you should apply your what life's work to this. So I went out yes. on a walk. I came back. It was solved. This is real for everybody. On it. You know, the the Mark Manson thing of subtle art and not giving a f- Yeah. That's what I did. Sometimes acceptance. Sometimes what you learn from things, your past and your failures is like, okay, that was a bad idea. And that's it. There isn't anything else to learn. So respectfully, uh, my ears are not getting any more of my unwanted attention. I, I, I'm not going to give it to them. But I'm not going to be thinking, oh, is it still ringing? Have I taken away the attention? Because as soon as you think, have you taken away the attention? You've attended. There's the attention. There's this subtle thing of you just don't give a f- and sometimes it has that face. Sometimes yeah. you learn from it. You know, sometimes, you know, that portrayal, when you really go into it, you learn something about what your values are, about what you did that didn't work with that relationship. But sometimes you learn things like next lifetime, don't stand in front of 160 <laughs> speakers. Right. Thank you. Okay, I got it. Steve, for the listener who is saying, I get it. I love this. Uh, I'm in. I want to learn more. What would, I guess, what would be the next action that they can take? What, you know, if they were to take an action in the next, next 24 to 48 hours to really start applying this to their lives outside of buying a liberated mind. And by the way, for the listener, I'll have the, the link to the book and the action plan. Just go to jimharshawjr.com slash action. I have the link right there. Yeah. But what, what's an action item that they can take in the next 24 to 48 hours? Well, and they could come to my website and I don't spam them, but they can get a seven mini seven on mini course and of course i'm doing it to capture the emails because i will send you then my blogs and sure. stuff like that but and just a one click out if you don't like it but i think the if you had this one thing you could do take a thought that you know has been a problem for you that pushes you in a direction where you don't want to go write that thought down actually write it down in the actual words and let's just take the things that you and i've talked about here and try them out so in other words, let your experience actually apply and see if, you, if for, for example, distill it down to a single word, say it out loud, look around, find a private place where <laughs> nobody's going to think you're nuts. Say that word like failure, loser, you know, I don't know what it is. Get it down there out loud fast for about 30 seconds and just watch what happens. And I pretty much we've done now something like. 
20 studies on this one little technique. It's one of hundreds that are you know, in the book, blah, blah, blah. The silly voices. Or here's one. I'll give you one that's a little different just to give you a little sense. How young were you when you first ever had thoughts like that? When you first ever wondered, were you good enough, lovable enough, smart enough, okay? Take the time to picture yourself at that age. And now take these thoughts that you're running around trying to erase and make different and have that child say that thought out loud in their child's voice, in your imagination. You as a young child saying those things. What do you want to do? My guess is you don't want to slap the kid. You don't want to say, stop it. You don't want to say, oh, you're thinking wrong. My guess is you probably want to hug the kid. So have a little compassion for yourself. You're a human being, and we're historical creatures. And, you know, if you've ever had something go into your nervous system, there's no delete button. It, you know, you don't forget. Can you name a painful memory that you've ever forgotten 100%? It's completely been eliminated from your life and had no impact on you? Of course not. Of course not. <laughs> so, so far as you know, once in, always in, right? Short of injury. And brain injury is not what we pray for, is it? Sure, right. So let's learn how to carry the voice within, learn from our history, carry those painful memories, but then bring our attention towards what's of importance and build a values-based life and habits around it. You do that, you've hacked the code. And uh, there's a lot of folks out there who will help you for free. We've got public support groups, for example, if you go to the groups.io and find act for the public, several thousand people are in a constant conversation there. And if, if you just wonder about how to apply all this act self-help stuff, there's hundreds of act books out there, hundreds. And so I'm not pitching my book or whatever, you know, or you, but you can just go on the internet and find lots of stuff for free. Come to my website. I'll send you stuff for free or just try what you and I have just talked about. Let your experience guide you. I'm and then if, do that. if you get a sense there's something in there, it's crazy. It sounds crazy. But actually, you know, there's something in there. Pursue it. You know, tr trust your experience and, and see what happens. I'm going to do that right after this episode. I'm going to do the exact action item you just gave us. So Awesome. Steve, wow. Uh, there's so much more here for the listener. There's so much more in the book. I urge you, if, if this struck a chord with you, get the book. Look for the resources. This is Steve's life, life's work. And like he said, he's not, his mission is to spread this and to give it away. And he told me that off air before we even started recording. His mission is to just give this away. This is amazing stuff. This is transformational stuff. Steve, thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming onto the show. Awesome. I had a great time. Thank you, Jim. And for the listener, make sure you grab the action plan for this, all the links to everything he just shared, uh, it's links to his website there, uh, where you can get the free seven-step course. Uh, it's all right there. I urge you to, to take action on this. And as always, until next time, take the time to get clear on your goals and embrace failure as a stepping stone on your path to success. I'm glad you're still here. I told you to tune in at the end of the episode, and I was going to share with you uh, what I did at the action for the action item that Steve shared there. So I did actually do that, and I just got done writing in my journal about sort of the mindset that I feel like I've kind of carried around with me for my whole life. That there was this, and it was this. There's this idea that there's a they. And they know something that you don't know, right? When I was young and it was wrestling, it was like, well, there's, there, there's this they out there and they know something that you don't know because they were raised with, a, you know, their fathers or brothers were wrestlers or for whatever excuse that was in my mind that got planted into my mind that, you know, there was a they, and then, you know, in this also this idea that there was a they in terms of success, in terms of money, in terms of whatever, I've always wrestled with that, that there's a they and they know something that you don't know. And what I remember when I overcame that in wrestling and it opened up this world to me where I could just put this baggage down that was on my back and just go out and compete freely and be my fullest self, bring everything that Jim is to the mat and compete at your, at your highest possible potential. And, and whatever happens, happens, win or lose. Uh, it, it's fun to compete that way. 
And I've made that shift in my business. And it's been a long, maybe a longer shift. I guess it took a long time in wrestling too. And then it was kind of this switch that flipped. And I've gone through that process in business and in life as well. I think I'm still going through that process because the more I really uh, bring my full, authentic, vulnerable, genuine self to conversations, to relationships, to this podcast even, the more things grow. And so that's what I wrote down. And I really boiled boil it down to they. And I don't have a Donald Duck voice, so I couldn't do that very well. Um, but I did say it. I said it out loud. It kind of felt weird, felt awkward. But guess what? When you learn about elite performers and the things that they do, there's often weird things that they do. And you go, man, they work once you do them. And for me, it really took the power away from this idea that there's a they out there that knows more than I do. Certainly, there's tactics that people know, but um, you can always work on those and get better. But there's not a they that knows some magic secret that you don't know. I encourage you to, to, to take action and, and do this same action plan for your, uh, the action item for yourself as well. Thanks for listening. If you got any value out of this, please give this a share. Just hit up your friends, send them a tweet, send them a text, and just tell them to check out this episode of the Success Through Failure podcast. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.